What is the relationship between the circumference of a circle and its area? Okay. Well, I can consider the area of this circle as made up of an infinite series of infinitesimally thin circumferences. Right? Watch, okay? First of all, you've got the circumference that's already there, okay? So it's 2 pi r in length, just by definition. Like, 2 pi is just the number that we designate for that because it's the ratio between the circumference and the diameter, okay? So you've got one there, right? Now, if you go a little bit smaller, you will have another circumference that has a radius, well, that's smaller than, sorry, a circumference that's 2 pi r, like, less than that. And then you get one that's a smaller again, it's smaller again, it's smaller again, and eventually, somewhere, you will eventually get a circumference which has, well, has no length. It's of zero length, okay? So you have this infinite series of infinitesimally thin circumferences, okay? All right, now, how will I add all of these things together? Well, the answer is I want to integrate them, right, like so. What are the things, what's the function that I'm adding up? And the answer is I'm adding up a whole bunch of circumferences, okay? Now, you remember over here, we usually talk about this as like a little width, dx, that's where it started from. But do you remember that I said um, at properties of definite integrals, right? That when you have a definite integral, this x, it's just a dummy variable. It's just kind of standing in as a number, right? Uh, it's not really, like, it's not that important what this thing is. It can be anything, right? So this thing is actually not changing with respect to x. There's no x in there, in fact. Okay? What's really changing with respect to is the radius, right? Like you've got the biggest circumference, which has a radius of r, and then you have a s the smallest circumference, which has a radius of zero, right? Like it's, it's, it occupies no space, it's just a point. Okay? So therefore we know that what you start with, your lower boundary is where that radius is zero, right? And the upper boundary is where the radius is the whole size of the circle, namely r, okay? So when you look at this, this is just a function. It's just a polynomial, right? All you have to do is the power thing, right? So you say, what's the primitive of 2 pi r? And you do what you normally do. You raise the power. You raise the power to 2. And then you divide by that power, right? And then you've got your lower and upper boundaries there. Okay? But of course, a couple of things cancel. Don't forget, you are actually evaluating it at two boundaries. So what you're getting is pi r squared take away 0. That's really where this comes from. You're doing more than just, you don't have to add up rectangles. You can add up circles if you want. You don't even have to add up things of like, these are, these are all one dimensional quantities, okay? Like just, you can see they're infinitesimally thin, okay? I can add up things with more dimensions. Example, this is the last one I'm gonna show you this morning, but there's so many more, okay? Archimedes, Archimedes, smart guy. He was the guy who worked out, does anyone know what he's famous for? Uh, okay, he, he, the screw is, is an important thing. The other thing he's famous for is the, um, if I remember right, it's the Eureka moment, isn't it? Right? He's trying to work out like volume and displacement of water and so on. Okay? Uh, he thought a lot about volume. Archimedes thought a lot about volume, right? One of the things he determined was if you have a sphere, right, a sphere, you want to know how, how big is the area around the sphere? Really, really clever. He worked out that if you've got a cylinder, Right? which has the same dimensions as the sphere. Namely, it's the same width and it's the same height. Then, very interestingly, and you can almost visualize that this is the case, the curved surface area of the cylinder will be the same as the surface area of the sphere. That's pretty cool, right? Um, you can almost imagine unwrapping, like take like a, like say a, um, you know, a tin of like canned food, right? And then you unwrap that thing, the, um, just the wrapper, okay? And if you cut a whole bunch of lines in here. You could place them around here and then you would fold them up and you would entirely encase the sphere. Okay? So he worked this out. Now, just really quickly, what is the curved surface area of this cylinder? Okay, remember, I'm just starting with any 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 sphere, right? So let's give it a radius of r. Okay. So therefore I'm gonna get all the same dimensions onto here, right? So I've got a radius of r here. Now how do I work out just the curved surface area? What numbers do I need? Okay, very good. I need this. Yeah, you're right, you're right. I need the height, obviously, okay? Now, because it's got the same dimensions as this sphere, the height is going to be r up this way and r up that, down that way. So this is 2r. Do you agree with that? 
And then remember I told you, you know, you start to unwrap your tin, tinned food, right? And what you get is a rectangle, right? Well, how wide? I've already worked out how high. How wide is the rectangle? Two pi r. Yeah, it comes from unwrapping the circumference, right? Which is 2 pi r. So you get the surface area in green here, which is the same as the surface area of the sphere. You get that surface area as 4 pi r squared, because it's 2 r times 2 pi r. Right? Now, if what I want to work out is volume, in the same way that area is just like a whole bunch of an infinite series of infinitesimally thin circumferences, volume, if you imagine like one of those um, Russian dolls, you know those babushka dolls where they're just made up of a whole bunch of like smaller and successively smaller dolls in there and it fills up the volume. So volume really is the, a sum of an infinite series of infinitesimally thin surface areas, right? Like those shells and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So therefore, what I'm integrating, the thing that I'm adding up and combining into a whole are a bunch of surface areas, right? And they are changing with respect to R. R is the thing that's changing as I go from that smallest surface area to the biggest one that's on the outside. The smallest one has a radius of zero and the biggest one has a radius of R. So you just do your normal thing and you say, well, what's the primitive function of four pi R squared? And you take the power up, right? To three, then you divide by that power and you evaluate it at the upper and lower bounds, which unsurprisingly is that sneaky little formula which you've learnt for so many years and not known where it came from. Okay? So here's my point, right? Indefinite integrals, right? We go toward indefinite integrals because you don't just need them to be attached to this simple problem, just like this is not just attached to light. Right? This says, you know what? Add up anything you like. Combine anything you like. And believe me, we'll combine a lot of different things. Right? That's why we're going to look at indefinite integrals. Right? It's the same problem as finding the primitive. So, bless you. When all that work that you spent anti-differentiating right, and finding the primitive, we can now import. It's literally exactly the same skill to integrate something when it has no boundaries. That's all you need to do. Okay? So in fact, some people read, you know, if I said to you, um, this, right, integrate x squared with respect to x, okay, you can literally read that as, tell me the primitive function of x squared, which of course is? <laughs> Remember, we're integrating, not differentiating, right? So this is, power goes up, divide by the power, don't forget the constant. Okay? Yes. Okay, very good. So, because in a definite integral, the reason we don't need to worry, do you remember the reason we don't need to worry about a constant? Because it gets added and then subtracted. So it just vanishes away whatever its value is. Okay. But an indefinite integral, it doesn't do that adding subtracting thing. So the constant is still there. Okay. And now is the perfect time to actually tell you, right? When we learnt about the primitive function, we said it has to have plus c because there's a whole family of them, right? But now that you know it's also attached to this process of integration, this c on the end, its proper name is the constant of integration. So now it gets a name because now you know how it comes about, right? Uh, it wouldn't have made much sense to say it's the constant of integration when you didn't know what an integral was, but now you do. Okay? Fun times. Okay, one last thing I'm going to mention, which is just a side note, and you guys know I actually hate having this conversation, but it's important for you to know anyway. Um, the constant of integration, as you can see, it actually represents, it's not a trivial thing. Like it represents, do you understand the difference between these two things and why there's like a whole family of these, right? So it's important. However, as you may well be able to imagine, right? In a typical exam paper, you're going to be calculating like five or six or seven or more of these indefinite integrals, which means there will be five or six or seven or more spots where you need to put a constant integration, okay? Now, we're not going to ping you every single time if you forget to write the constant integration on your whole paper. What will happen is, out of those five or six or seven questions, we will pick one of them. And we will say, okay, that question, if you leave off the constant integration, even though it's like a, it seems like a minor error, you will lose an entire mark, right? One whole mark on that. I should let you know, it kind of does stand out because when you see a question like this, right? This is a one mark question. Really? Like, there's not much to do here. 
If you see this question and it has two marks on it, they want the C. Kind of a bit of a C. Now, you should always have the C. You should always have the C, okay? But this will explain why you might, you might think, oh, it's such a little thing. How did I lose a whole mark for it? And the answer is we're only checking for it once. If you make the same error five or six or seven times, you know, we'll only, we'll only penalize it once. But we have to penalize it somewhere because it represents an understanding. Does that make sense?